Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Let's see, I'll wait just a second, make sure. Danielle, whenever you're ready. Okay. All right, well, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another one of our 1130 city briefings uh, with for all things with respect to coronavirus. First, I want to just thank the public, uh, as well as everyone working in public safety, healthcare, and our child care workers, uh, and everyone who's driving and being involved in different things to try and keep our city running. Um, there's obviously a lot evolving with respect to the state's more recent instructions. So today we're going to go into depth on uh, what this means for the city of Albuquerque. Also want to emphasize, emphasize that I know a lot of businesses right now are having to deal with this in their own right. And so I want to acknowledge that I know this is uh, especially tough too for them. And it's going to just speak to the long economic recovery that we're going to have to endure uh, once we get past the public health phase of this. Now, following the state instructions, there are a lot of city orders that uh, we're going to talk about, or a lot of city instructions that are pursuant to that that we're going to talk about today. Now, I guess first and foremost, I just want to mention that uh, it's very serious and important that we all as a community work on some of this. When we look at what other cities are going through, it's easy to see, you know, packed basketball courts and block parties happening in L.A. and New York and Chicago uh, and see why their mayors are having to take a much, much stronger approach. They are presumably actually in a very analogous situation to the city of Albuquerque. It's just we might be a week sort of behind them. So we're going to see what happens in Albuquerque. But I want to let folks know just in terms of geographic spread that we want to prevent what is happening in other big cities around the country. And I also know while a lot of people might watch this or hear this who live all around New Mexico and rural New Mexico, it's important for every Burqueño to know that our city is Chicago for New Mexico. It is Denver for Colorado, meaning that we're the urban center, we're where all the hospitals are, we're where the highest density is. That makes us by far and away the highest risk of anywhere else in New Mexico for the spread of this, uh, uh, this virus. So in the future, we may have to take precautions that actually are stronger than the state. We are not at this time, but I want to let folks know that uh, it's very possible that the city needs and situation might be divergent from the states. Now, that could go in either direction. That's absolutely true in either direction. But I do want to mention that uh, because, again, of the fact that our city is the urban core for about a thousand square miles, uh, it usually means that we might have to do things longer than the rest of the state, or we might have to do things more intensely than the rest of the state. Uh, but right now we are in step with the state. And so that's what we're gonna talk about. First, a few updates uh, just from other entities in central New Mexico. Uh, Loveless is holding a blood drive on Wednesday between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. in the parking lot of Longfellow Elementary. That's right off Lomas uh, outside of downtown. And also, uh, it's kind of at the corner of Dr. Martin Luther King and Walnut Street. Also, if you need information, please call uh, Vitalent at 246-1457. And again, all our hospitals continue to be short on blood and short on PPEs. If you can help with either of those, please let us know. Also, all hospitals are now on a no visit policy. So you can check on the specifics, but in general, uh, visitations are no longer being allowed at all of our city's hospitals. Now, an update on city services. Uh, first, want to direct everyone, of course, if you have questions, cabq.gov is pretty much up to date within at least hours. So check on that if you have any questions. Now I'm going to go into city uh, updates in terms of the state instruction from yesterday, uh, where we're at today with respect to a lot of things in the city of Albuquerque. Our city is continuing to adapt our buildings, programs, and services to protect public health and also to maintain essential services. I'm going to pause for just a minute here for our, looks like APD helicopter. Nope, Loveless. <clears throat> okay, so uh, again, our city is continuing to do what we can to protect public health, 
but also to make sure that we're maintaining essential services. And we're going to talk about a number of those here. Also, I've had a lot of questions about are we engaging new emergency powers, et cetera. At this time, we are not. We're still working under the city's current executive uh, emergency order. So new closures. All city buildings are going to be closed to the public uh, as of now, basically, or at least by the end of the day as we work through this. Now, there are some exceptions, including the building that we're standing in front of. This is the John Marshall Center for Public Health and Services that we're going to talk about. There are four of these around the city that we're keeping open explicitly uh, for a number of things, which we're going to hear about in a minute. But in general, all city buildings are closed to the public. That includes City Hall. I uh, want to also thank the county. Uh, and their county manager. We share that facility, of course, with the county. And so uh, you can direct specific questions to them, especially about the county clerk. Uh, there are some exceptions with respect to the county clerk, but I want to direct that uh, to the county. So the city clerk, different than the county clerk, uh, is also going to be closed to the public. Again, different than the county clerk, so marriage licenses and so forth. Please check in with the county on details with respect to that. But the city clerk office uh, is closed, but it will be delaying or holding remote hearings. Those of you who are familiar with what those are for, sometimes they're for animal welfare, sometimes they're for environmental health. Uh, we're going to try and do remote hearings as much as we can. The city of Albuquerque Water Authority is temporarily closing all of its walk-in payment locations. That does include One Civic Plaza, West Side Office, and Plaza del Sol. Of course, they're still taking payments by mail and online, and I believe over the phone. Call 311 with questions about any of this. Uh, we've also closed our child development centers, so our Head Start programs and our pre-K programs are now closed. Our golf courses, unfortunately, are also now closed. Uh, the planning department is also closed except, and this is an important exception for our business community, permitting and inspections are being scheduled and arranged by phone and digitally. So the city is still open with respect to doing construction business, just not at the physical building Plaza del Sol. So we're also creating a Dropbox program where if you do have to drop off documents, you drop them off and they'll still be able to be reviewed. So we're going to have more on that tomorrow uh, from our planning department. Our spring break programming is now also officially canceled. So Maya's Farm Camp, no longer, uh, and all the other respective city uh, programs. That also includes Explora. So uh, I do want to mention one caveat here. There is emergency daycare available at our community centers. This is only to be used for folks who have to work, right? When staying home is not a choice, we know that staying home is a luxury for a lot of people. So if you have to work, and right now we're not asking a lot of questions, so uh, we're expecting people to respect this. And if you are either because of income or single parent situation, or because you're in a central worker and you have to work, you can drop your child off at our community centers. We're gonna keep doing that as long as it's feasible with respect to both distancing uh, and uh, need. And so that is, again, an emergency safety net that we're continuing to prop up at our community centers. It's not available at every community center. It's available at most community centers. So please call 311 to get more details with respect to that. At the airport, as an update, there's going to be more details coming out. But the short story is traffic is 90% down. The airport is a ghost town, and it should be right now. That's actually a good thing. You should only be flying if it is an emergency situation or if you're trying to get home. But also, because the airport is critical, especially to cargo, uh, the airport is actually open as an emergency infrastructure uh, transport facility. So again, airport, it's very empty, uh, but it is open. Transit. Transit is going to be phasing in uh, a much reduced schedule and this is going to probably happen this weekend. I want to also take this opportunity to thank our, all of the blue collar workers at the city, our transit drivers. Uh, we are in a lot of discussions with respect to our collective bargaining agreement and how we deal with uh, our obligations with respect to union workforce and so forth. The unions have been tremendously cooperative and supportive of everything that we're going through. But we also have to follow some rules, and transit is a good example. Uh, it's not appropriate at this time to simply shut down transit in any fashion. We have to do it over time, and time just means a couple of days. So by this weekend, we are expecting the following to be in place. 
it's a Saturday schedule will be every day going forward. So that's a very, very reduced schedule. And again, uh, one, we're reducing it for public health reasons. Two, we are keeping a limited schedule open because we do know that people are using the bus to get groceries and to go to hospital visits. So it is important that that avenue is available for, again, folks under essential activities. Right now, we need some public transit running. So look to 311 or ABQ ride for details on what that looks like. But if you need to know now, plan for the Saturday schedule, right? So this is a reduced schedule on key routes. That's gonna be operational, at least for the time being, every day going forward starting this weekend. Also related to this, the art project will stop this weekend. Not the project, the art route. Uh, so the art route, that whole thing is gonna stop this weekend. The local 666, there's only two sixes in that. The local 66 route will continue. That's part of the Saturday operating schedule that we're gonna be using. So there will be service on Central, but it's going to be the uh, local service only. Uh, ART will be uh, ceasing to work effective this Saturday. Still closed is the Biopark, libraries, museums, and theaters. Also our senior centers, except for meals. Meal pickup still very much in operation. So is meal delivery. Again, call 311 with questions there. Uh, and of course, our community centers will be closed to the public, except for that emergency required uh, child care and our swimming pools, of course, are still closed. Now, believe it or not, I have more updates. So let's talk a little bit about public safety. Uh, our police stations, of course, are still open. Our substations are still able to uh, take reports. We, of course, want to encourage people to do this over the phone or online. But again, as part of our emergency infrastructure right now, we are able to keep our substations open. Uh, the, of course, fire, AFR, or fire marshal, all of that is still operating and running. 911 dispatch, of course, still operating and running. Our emergency operations center operating and running, as is DMD security. So is DMD traffic. Uh, again, these are the folks who either fix traffic lights, keep roads open, set up temporary changes in traffic, and also continuing to pave our roads and do the kind of construction work that is both permissible and important. We're gonna try and do as much construction as we can while no one is out on the streets. Animal welfare control also right now open. Our animal welfare offices continue to be open for adoption by appointment only. So again, they're sort of closed to the public except by appointment. There's no change with respect to that. Uh, needle pickup program still running, parks, uh, uh, public safety efforts still up and running, open space uh, patrols and uh, areas uh, up and running. Now, solid waste, a couple of important things here. Solid waste, one, of course, is still gonna continue. So trash pickup, expect no changes for your trash pickup at home. With respect to commercial pickup, there's a lot less commercial waste, as you can imagine, because all the businesses are closed down. So we are working with the union to flex our staff to be able to do more residential pickup because there is more trash now at people's houses. So again, our department is continuing to work on this. We also are keeping our convenience centers open. You know, spring is actually the busiest time for these centers right now. So they are open, but I, I wanna encourage folks to just be judicious in when you go to those. If they get too crowded, we're gonna have to work on something else. Uh, but right now they are open uh, as they normally would be. In general, essential workers, uh, the city has gone through and listed who needs to be at work, who's essential and who's not under this order. We outlined all of that this morning. I do want to mention there are some important examples that people don't think about, like someone has to feed the animals at the zoo. So uh, if you see different city workers and so forth, uh, they should know and they should be working for a specific reason. And again, our city HR department has worked out details with respect to that. All right, so meal prep and delivery also up and running from our family and community uh, center. Also all homeless services, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute, absolutely essential and are up and running still and actually at an enhanced level. We're gonna dive into that in just a little bit. Actually, we're gonna dive into that right now. So what I wanna do is get ready to transition to our, direct, our deputy director for housing and homelessness, uh, Lisa Huval and she's gonna talk about what is operating right now and how we're dealing with homelessness. And also, we have lots of ways to help. In upcoming 1130 briefings, we're gonna talk about ways people can help. We have a need right now for hotel vouchers, for donations 
for hotel vouchers. Call 311 if you're interested in doing that, or you can donate online, uh, and we're going to be talking about how to do that, but the shortest way is just donate at onealbuquerque.org. And we are going to be each day talking about different ways to highlight this. But in general, uh, right now, there is a need for hotel vouchers. So Lisa Huval, I think you're close. Come on up. Good afternoon, everybody. Can folks hear me OK? Do I need to lower the mic? OK. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we have been working with our closely with our community partners over the last two weeks to quickly put in a system uh, to make sure that we can identify uh, folks that might have COVID-19 who are experiencing homelessness, that we can quickly uh, con test to see if they have COVID-19. And then for those who do, make sure that we can provide a safe place for them to rest and recover where they are isolated from other folks that do not have COVID-19. I am really pleased to report that thanks in large part to our partnerships that we have been able to uh, make great progress over the last two weeks in putting this system in place. I wanna take a moment to thank Heading Home, who we contract with to operate the Westside Emergency Housing Center, the Medical Reserve Corps and Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless. There's other partners as well, but these have really been three core partners. Where we're at right now is um, we do have a process in place to screen folks that are staying at our West Side Emergency Housing Center, which is our largest, our largest shelter in Albuquerque. We have a process in place for those that do uh, screen um, positive on the screening criteria to quickly test those folks. Um, and then we have an isolated space for folks to rest and recover within the West Side Emergency Housing Center. I forgot to. We know, um, however, so this is an important component of the system that we have in place. But like the mayor mentioned, we also know that under certain circumstances, being able to provide a motel voucher for someone experiencing homelessness will also be an important part of this system. Currently, we have a limited amount of motel voucher of funding and we have funding available and we have a system in place to utilize those motel vouchers, but we expect the demand only to increase over the coming weeks. And this is certainly something we could use help with from the community. I want to stress that um, the motel vouchers will be for people experiencing homelessness and we will be working with our core medical partners, particularly the Medical Reserve Corps and Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless to identify who needs those motel vouchers. This will be a limited resource that we will be working closely with our medical partners to allocate uh, to, the, to the folks that really need it for medical reasons. Um, and I think that concludes what I wanted to say. Oh, I should also add um, as, a, as another effort to really help uh, keep people safe at the Westside Emergency Housing Center, um, which is crowded under normal circumstances. Uh, we have created some separate shelter space for folks within two of our community centers for people that are over 60 years of age. These are folks that are um, do not have COVID-19, are otherwise healthy, um, and we want to make sure they stay that way. So we really appreciate all of the community partnership to put all of this in place. Thank you. Okay, the uh, information that we're gonna go into next is about our particular uh, centers, including the one we're at today. And our deputy director of public health is gonna discuss that, uh, Gilbert Ramirez. And as he uh, comes up, I wanna highlight two different ways to help. This is a, I'm not gonna show the cameras, it's a copy of a check, which is awesome. Uh, a donation to uh, our health and social service centers uh, to help with rental assistance. So um, Claire from Placidas, uh, we'll keep your last name hidden. Thank you. She donated $500 to help with rental assistance. Hotel vouchers and rental assistance right now is our big ask. Thank you, Claire. And uh, Gilbert, come tell us how this is gonna work and how others can help. Good morning. 
My name is Gilbert Ramirez, Deputy Director, working over the uh, Health and Social Service Center. So I just want to talk a little bit about how vital these centers are and how to access them and what programming we have. So we do have four health and social services centers that were identified as mission critical under a time like this. So as the mayor spoke to, as far as essential services and what we offer here, our team, and I want to thank all of our managers and the staff that are here keeping these buildings open because we do provide crucial services out of these centers. So um, we provide various services here, and I want to kind of go over the guidelines for those. One, every center is located, we have one in every quadrant of the city. It is important that those who need to access these centers access the one in the quadrant of the city they're located, whether it's southeast, northeast, southwest, northwest. Uh, we do recommend that you can call 311 if you're not sure what center is the best to contact, um, and they can guide you to the appropriate quadrant area or center to go to. That way, nobody is wasting time driving across town. Um, the beauty to that uh, format is that we're able to provide services in the quadrant are most needed. Uh, we offer various things based on availability for e individuals who do live within the city limits. Um, and there are some requirements to access some of these programs that we are doing our best to make sure that we screen everyone to see what they qualify for and or look for alternatives or partners in the community to connect them to those services. So some of the things you can get here are food boxes. Uh, we do monthly food boxes for families who are, are needed and you can come in to see if you qualify again by your quadrant area. Uh, we also have limited supplies of diapers and or hygiene products and or clothing. We have a clothing bank. So those needs should be identified if you're calling in to see what you might need and how to access them. Uh, additionally, I want to move into our eviction prevention program. We do have uh, federal funding under the Housing uh, Urban Development HUD program to be able to allow uh, some eviction prevention. The monies are limited, um, but we will work with anyone who has not already accessed this service to look at how we can support them. There is some criteria. I'm going to pause. Okay, there is some criteria in order to qualify for these programs. You do have to have an ID. You do have to have a lease agreement or a payment agreement that shows, and most likely uh, some information around the delinquency and how much is owed. But our team can guide you through that to be able to see if you qualify for that. Additionally, this, um, the health and social service centers we have do have an established method for individuals who just want to donate money. Much like the mayor just uh, mentioned, we had a $500 donation. We are in need of additional funding to be able to help people who perhaps do not qualify for our eviction prevention program under our federal dollars. With that money, we can then work a little bit more to support families who might have the utility needs or rental assistance needs that don't qualify for those programs. We're very confident that our team can be able to assess and see what program you best qualify for, but at this time we know it's crucial um, and we are working to make sure that we have those resources available for everyone. So again, I do encourage the community, call 311, identify the quadrant of the area of the city you live in, and they can best guide you to the Health and Social Service Center that you can connect with to see what services you can get. I know from a report I got yesterday, we issued 140 food boxes just yesterday. We're tracking everything coming out of here um, and so if families are needing that, please make sure that you access and call so that we can get you um, the support that you need within what we have available. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all about the vital services happening at our health and social service centers. Any additional information you also might need can be found at cabq.gov. Thank you. Okay, so we are helping prop up in many ways, I think, those vulnerable communities, those in need with these four centers. So going forward, uh, just want to thank Gilbert and his team and uh, Carol and everyone at Family Community. Uh, these four centers are, at least from a city perspective, you know, these are a place of last resort for folks. And so it's very fortunate in Albuquerque that we both have the dedicated staff and team and facilities to have these four, one in each quadrant of the city. Okay, again, if folks want to donate, you can call 311 for details or just go to onealbuquerque.org. Now, we're going to move on to our other sections that we go through each day for this, and then we'll be here for your questions. Myth busting. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about asymptomatic versus symptomatic. Uh, reminder for folks that you could be a carrier or a spreader of corona, even if you're not showing symptoms. So that's an important piece. Just want to remind everyone that it's like, oh, I feel great and this and that. 
No, that's you. That's why we all have to stay home because you could be spreading it even if you don't know or you feel fine. So I want to just connect that with this concept of stay at home. Also want to remind folks that with respect to things like house parties, dinner parties, game night parties, all of those are terrible ideas right now. I just want to emphasize that I know some folks are out of work and we want to hang out and see each other. That is completely against this concept of stay at home. So I know it's a little bit of a downer, but it's very serious. And so we want to make sure that folks uh, are also, even if you're in lines, try and stay spaced apart as best you can. And then, of course, remember, after going out in public of any kind, uh, sanitize, wash hands, etc. cetera. Uh, of course, with allergies and whatnot, cough in your elbow, those kinds of activities are really important when you are out in public. Okay, we're going to switch to our uh, question and answer session now. Uh, on a lighter note, the takeout last night in our household most recently was Golden Pride Barbecue Chicken. Outstanding. Family favorite. Okay, questions on this. <clears throat> Anyone in person? Oh, I, I do. We'll start in person, then we'll go to uh, Zoom. Perfect. For the help, um, a lot of people have been asking us for the Spanish speaking audience. Um, do you have to have a social security number to receive this help or, you know, any uh, legal status? So anything that the city provides does not require a social security number uh, or any uh, questions about documentation or anything of that nature. That's also all forbidden by a city ordinance. So uh, those questions here are very, um, that's something you don't have to worry about at all as long as it's, as it's a city run facility. We also are running our Spanish language Twitter. Uh, so for the news media and others, uh, please pay, pay particular attention to that, as well as our Office of OIRA, Office of Immigrant and Refugee Services is absolutely open and can still be contacted in the same way it was before. The question from the journal is how much money does the city have available for rental assistance? Again, this is a very new program, et cetera. Uh, Gilbert, if you have an answer, come on up. Thank you for that question. So currently under our federal program that uh, meets the HUD requirements for eviction prevention, we have just under $47,000 remaining in that account. Um, with regards to our trusting agency account, um, that money right now is just under $10,000, which isn't a lot, and that's why we are asking that if anyone can and is able to donate any money to that. Within the city structure, we are looking if there are available monies that we can move over to support and increase that account. Um, but of course, that's internally, we are looking at where we have money to pull from that. Um, but yes, they are limited resources and we are working to kind of increase that. And we also, again, ask, and this is why the need is huge, that for those who do not meet the federal requirement HUD program, we need alternatives. And if you can make a donation, it would be helpful. Okay, yes. Just to clarify, um, one for the hotel vouchers, if people want to donate, like the community, they're going online to donate money to, like, how, what's the process like? So uh -huh. there's no confusion in terms of them wanting to help get hotel vouchers. Let me just check. The question is about hotel vouchers, a little more details. Did Lisa already escape? She. Uh, you gotta go, I can answer this. Okay, uh, Gilbert will take that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. So currently we have uh, already allocated about $50,000 into the hotel voucher uh, fund. Uh, we're sitting on this under our trust and agency account and individuals who have donated can restrict their money. So an individual wants to donate specifically to support hotel vouchers. They just need to put that restriction on that donation. It will only support hotel vouchers. If they are willing to support other resources and allow my team to decide oh, it's for diapers, it's for formula. It should be an unrestricted uh, donation. Um, but we can take that. We've moved a pot of money in there currently to support that, and we're building that system out so that we can move on that as soon as possible. So the question is, what are we doing, if anything, to enforce the governor's stay-at-home order? Uh, what we're doing right now, first off, the state is the lead on all of the state orders, and so that hasn't changed. So obviously, for direct enforcement questions uh, directed to the state, with respect to Albuquerque, here's what we're really looking at. Uh, EPD may do some calls and knocks and visits on large gatherings. 
uh, if it's a business or it's outside and it's violating the state order. We did have an incident uh, a couple of days ago where there was a, a large party at Tower Park. Uh, these are the kinds of things that are absolutely dangerous right now. So uh, EPD is working on that aspect. The other aspects are going to be handled by state agencies with one other exception. We are very much encouraging folks to make sure and only buy what you need. Try and go to the grocery store once a week. And again, just get what you need for a week. That's the basic guideline. And where the city, again, in Albuquerque, we know because of our density, uh, we have to also help out with some of this. And so with respect to enforcement, I mentioned what APD is doing with respect to this worries about hoarding and things of this at grocery stores. We're doing two things. One, APD and AFR are having a continued enhanced presence at our major grocery stores. And that's just to remind everyone to stay calm and stay safe. Uh, but our environmental health department is also going to start uh, contacting all of the major stores with respect to the restrictions that the state has put in place. So I want to remind everyone the state has already limited the amount of certain goods that retailers or grocers are allowed to sell. The city is now going to help remind and enforce that. We're doing that through our environmental health department and uh, with some help from our code enforcement. I also am personally talking to some of our major uh, grocers about that later this afternoon. And again, want to remind everyone, systematically, there is plenty of supplies in America right now. And so it's true that if everyone just gets what they need, we're not going to have any shortages. But as we know, folks have been, uh, you know, essentially getting more than they need, and that's why our shelves look empty. So this is a this is a self fulfilling prophecy that we need to stop. And we're going to work at it with the grocers level. And we're just asking everyone to try and individually, uh, please just buy what you need for one week and go to the store once a week. Yes. Uh huh. So the way the there's a question about kind of parks and so forth. Uh, one is that the uh, the state has asked everyone to stay home, which means they do not want anyone going to parks. Uh, our parks are, you know, obviously there, and so I'm just saying there is an exception for exercise. If you're going to use that exception, go there and then get home and absolutely stay personally distanced. So again, the state is asking people not to go to parks. Uh, there is an exception, I believe, for exercise. So uh, are we are uh, officially closing all our playgrounds. So that will be posted and noticed. Uh, with respect to open space, that's a little bit different. Uh, again, for exercise, go to open space and stay separated and apart and follow that personal hygiene. Uh, so last week the governor said that um, she was going to talk to mayors about um, about this travel for the Suncor and limiting it. And then I know you mentioned that travel is down 90%. Um, was that a result of talks with the governor or is that just because simply people are traveling less? Uh, we're in regular communication with the governor on a number of issues, including the Sunport. And I think the market and people's own behavior is really taking care of this. Almost no one is traveling. There are planes leaving our town with one person on them. And actually, I believe one airlines has already canceled a lot of flights, including all their flights into the Sunport. So uh, the market is really downsizing this uh, appropriately. And two, the federal government requires the airport to be open. And we do agree with that conceptually. We need cargo going through there and we need emergency transport. So that's going to be the same. But I think the concerns before, which were very real and I was concerned about as well, is it was a place of mass gathering. That's not happening. I was personally out at the airport two days ago, and it's a complete ghost town. Um, there is, I mean, there's better separation at the airport than in our grocery stores, for sure. So I think the airport is no longer at least a spread contagion uh, type situation. Also, we do have the uh, reserves. Uh, the DOH and the governor have been great. There's uh, a setup there where there are two uh, reserve officers out there who are informing people of all of this right as they pass through security. So I think we've taken care of the airport and we're in the right place with respect to emergency services, cargo, and otherwise almost zero uh, travelers. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, I want to thank everyone very much. Stay tuned. We're going to be sending 
Uh, we're going to be sending all of this out, uh, of course, on our social media platforms. That's really a good way to end. Uh, but uh, we will be sending this out on our social media platforms and we'll be back again at 1130 tomorrow. Thank you.